Hi, and welcome to the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. I'm your host, Tom Rosenbauer. You might have heard that you need a lot of expensive, complicated gear for fly fishing, and that it's really difficult to learn. Well, I'm sitting here on a dock fly fishing for sunfish and having a ball. Does it look like I have a lot of expensive gear? Let's see how, just how difficult it is to fly fish. Oh, you got him. <laughs> oh, wow. so tame when you've been caught. Because this is the way you cast. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region where Huron and Superior meet. So did that look hard? Did I need a lot of expensive gear? I don't think so. That sunfish bent this three weight rod pretty hard. Pretty little pumpkin seed. Lots of fun. Very simple. It's just another way of fishing. <laughs> Cute little rock bass right here in a little city park. Ate a little bluegill bug. And away he goes. You know, you don't have to go to an exotic trout stream or a bonefish flat or, or halfway around the world to have a lot of fun fly fishing. A lot of times you can find it right in your own backyard. I'm here in a city park. There are bass and bluegills in Central Park. There are steelhead in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan. There are trout in downtown Atlanta. But there's great fly fishing nearly everywhere you go. The more you fly fish, the more you practice. So find a place close to home, get out there, and catch whatever's available. Could be catfish, could be carp, could be bass. Usually it's sunfish. Could be creek chubs or fallfish. Something like that, but they're all fun on a fly rod, so don't just reserve it for the more glamorous species. You're missing a lot of the fun. That's my best carp ever. <laughs> you never know what you're gonna find in some of these urban fisheries, which is what makes it really interesting. Looks almost like a trout stream, doesn't it? It's not, this is full of sunfish and some bass and carp, but it's got some current. I can practice casting. I can practice mending line. I can practice all the things that I might want to do in a trout stream, but I can also catch some fish. Some of these little sunfish fight pretty hard. It's not exactly what I had in mind. However, it is a smallmouth bass. <laughs> Miniature smallmouth. <laughs> yeah, that one's a little bigger. Don't give up. Yeah. Maybe I'll get a 10 incher someday, huh? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> that's, pretty, that's putting a pretty good bend into this eight weight. It's nice to dream about that once a year trip to the mountains or the ocean. But if fly fishing is an important part of your life, why wait 11 months to get out there and fish? You might find some excitement just around the corner and you'll probably add some new species to your fly fishing life list. Cute little smallmouth bass, fought like a tiger. Doesn't get much better, especially when you're five minutes from home. So how do you find fishing close to home? The easiest way is to find the closest body of water where you can legally fish and cast without putting anyone else in danger. Oh yeah, go! Ooh. Then visit it at different times of the day to look for swirls or other signs of feeding fish. If you suspect bass or pike are present, try a generic streamer like a woolly bugger. If you've seen sunfish you've or suspect em. they're in your local body of water, try a small popper or dry fly. Fish won't be everywhere in any lake or river. Try shallower water first, then try deeper water. 
fish around log jams or weed beds. In the spring, look for the saucer-shaped nest that sunfish and bass make when they spawn in the shallows. Fish over these nests are typically very aggressive and will attack any fly that comes near them. You know, it's not about the size fish you catch. I'm having a ball with these little smallmouth bass in this park. And you shouldn't feel weird about, uh, about fishing in parks because um, people come up and talk to you and they're, they're usually really interested in what you're doing and it's always fun, no matter what kind of fish you're catching. You'll seldom need waders for this kind of fishing. Most of the time, you'll be fishing the shores of ponds and parks or even walking on a sidewalk. You might need a pair of waterproof hiking shoes but whatever you'd ordinarily wear for a walk in the park will work. You hear that fly fishing is a really expensive sport. Well, the whole outfit that Jackson is using there is under $200. What else do you need, really, to go fly fishing? You need a box of flies, a pair of snips, probably a pair of forceps, and a spool of leader material. You can put it all in your pocket, and off you go. Once you find a local fishing spot, and you get to know it a little better, you'll find that a few hours of fly fishing with your family to be one of the most satisfying things you can do Good together. Good job! Carp are revered in Europe and Asia as game fish and food fish. In North America, they've been maligned for over a hundred years because they muddy up waters with their feeding habits and because they're so prolific and adaptable. But like other invasive starling and pigeons, Carp are here to stay, so we might as well enjoy them. <laughs> you may be surprised to discover that carp have become a highly prized fly rod species. They have everything a trophy fish should have. They're strong, spooky, and difficult to catch. Some people say they're more of a challenge than bonefish. Because carp feed on slow-moving prey and food that falls into the water, they can be caught with bait, but it's very difficult to catch them on conventional lures, which is why fly rods have become popular for catching carp. No tool is better than a fly rod for dropping a small lure precisely and delicately in front of a feeding carp. Just because carp are everywhere doesn't mean they're easy to catch. First, you have to find carp in clear water, where you can spot them. If your carp are in muddy water, they have to be feeding in very shallow water where you can see their fins and tails sticking out of the water. Another time to catch carp on a fly is when they're eating surface food. Carp will eat insects, cottonwood fluff, and berries, especially mulberries, when they fall into the water. So you have to search for carp in shallow water or feeding on the surface. It's essential to get a fly right in front of them, and if you can't see where a fish is feeding, you won't be able to catch one. Blind casting over deeper water for carp is almost impossible. Once you find a carp feeding, keep your profile low and move slowly. Keep false casting to a minimum. You can also use brush at the edge of the water to hide your profile. Also, if the fish are in the sun, Try to position yourself in the shade so your movements will be less noticeable. You want to get close enough to make an accurate cast, but not so close that you scare the fish. Cast a slow sinking nymph or streamer in front of a cruising or tailing carp. Wait until the fish gets a few feet from the fly and then begin to move the fly slowly and steadily. Sometimes an occasional twitch also helps because carp love to eat crayfish which tend to move in spurts along the bottom. Watch the reaction of the fish. If it suddenly darts toward the fly, slow down a bit. If the carp turns away and seems to lose interest, give the fly a longer twitch to catch its attention. Experiment. Carp in different waters prefer different retrieves, and it may take you scores of casts to figure out what interests them. Some carp are very aggressive, especially those feeding on baitfish or crayfish, prey that moves quicker. Carp that feed more on insects and small invertebrates are not as aggressive and they can be extremely challenging. And if you find carp in a current, fish your fly dead drift, the same as if you were nymphing for trout. 
If you see a lot of carp, the best ones to target are those that root in the shallows or those that cruise slowly. Fish that swim quickly are either moving from one place to another or they've been spooked by something. Doesn't mean you can't catch these fast moving fish, but they'll be tougher. Flies for carp can be as easy or as complicated as you want. Many fly fishers catch them on small streamers like the woolly bugger, which imitates perhaps a crayfish or a baitfish. Trout nymphs in size 8 through 12 are also effective, especially those with lots of wiggly action. Where carp feed on berries, you may want to try a steelhead egg pattern and just let it drop in front of a carp. Smaller bonefish flies in sizes 6 and 8 are also effective where carp feed on crustaceans. But if you really want to get serious about fly fishing for carp, there are a number of new fly patterns developed especially for these freshwater bruisers. And they're proven patterns that will probably work better than flies developed for other species. I was having lunch at a riverside restaurant once when I saw some large carp right under the dining area, apparently catching pieces of food thrown over the railing by diners. So I went to the sidewalk across from the restaurant and cast to the fish with some big nymphs. It was heart pounding as the giant fish rose up to inspect my fly time after time and finally I got a couple to eat the nymph. The hardest part of fishing for carp is determining when they've taken the fly. They won't pull the rod out of your hand and you may not feel a carp until it's hooked. Watch the fish. If it moves toward your fly, and then turns away, or if you see the white of its lips, tighten the line by making a long strip. If the fish was not hooked, it might chase the fly again, and if it is hooked, give it a sharp jab and hang on. You know, carp are found in most urban environments and people consider them a trash fish, but they are amazing fish on a fly rod. And I don't know if I'm gonna land this one, probably not, but I'm having a ball trying. <laughs> carp are strong fighters that do not give in easily. Often they pull line off the reel like a bonefish, so be prepared with a reel with a smooth drag. Six to eight weight rods are best match with a floating line and a long leader. Most carp anglers prefer 9 to 12 foot fluorocarbon leaders, the same leader you'd use for bonefish or redfish. That's pretty light for a 20 pound carp, but carp are so spooky that a tippet heavier than 12 pounds might put them off. You know, carp are actually really wary game fish. You have to go down to a pretty light tippet and they're really, really spooky. So they're a true challenge, and there are people that, that travel a long way for carp. Uh, you can find them in most cities, and they are a worthy fly rod adversary. Believe me, they'll beat you up. I've get, I'm got this carp sort of whipped. I don't know what I'm gonna do with him. I don't know how I'm gonna land him. We probably won't land him, but it was sure fun seeing him take that nymph just like a great big old trout or a bonefish. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a heck of a battle, and we're not done yet. I don't know if I can lift his head up. That battle with the big carp was really exciting, and luckily, a pair of bystanders helped me with a big net. That's my best carp ever. <laughs> If you want one of the toughest freshwater fish on a fly rod, try your hand at carp fishing. They're stronger and spookier than trout and pull harder than bass. Plus, you'll be well prepared for bonefish or redfish when you get the opportunity because if you can catch carp on the fly, these saltwater fish will be a piece of cake. Although you may dream of trout fishing trips to faraway places, you may have trout fishing closer to home than you think. Big rivers are all well known to trout anglers, but sometimes small streams are found much closer to civilization, but they get ignored because of their size. 
There are fine wild trout streams as far south as northern Georgia if you're willing to move a couple thousand feet up in elevation to find cooler water. The fish may not be as big as trout in Montana or New Zealand, but they're trout all the same. And most likely, they'll have beautiful colors and may be stream bred, not fish from hatcheries. So let's get some tips on fishing these little streams that might be closer to home than you think. One of the things about fishing in small streams is that you don't want to belabor any spot for very long. You're either going to catch the fish or you're going to spook it. So the water's shallow, the fish can see all around them. If you don't get them on those first couple casts, it's probably a good idea to move on to the next little pocket. You don't want to spend a lot of time in any particular area. So I'm going to try this pocket here. I'm going to try a pocket there, try a pocket there. And it's called, kind of, it's called picking pockets. Should you work upstream or downstream when you're fishing a small stream? Well, it really doesn't matter. Most people like to fish upstream because the fish are facing in that direction and they can't see as well behind them so that you come up behind them in their blind spot. Plus, most of the time you're fishing a dry fly or a nymph and it's a lot easier to fish a dry fly or nymph upstream. One of the things you wanna be always aware of in a small stream is what's behind you, not only do you want to keep your back cast out of the trees, so you need to make sure you have clearance behind you, but also you always want to have some protection behind you so that you're not silhouetted against the sky. Small stream fish are spooky. Anything that moves above the horizon is going to catch their eye immediately. They're going to be scared and they're going to stop feeding. Clothing color in small stream fishing is relatively important. You want to wear something like this green that kind of matches the foliage behind you. I don't think you have to go crazy and, and get a camouflage shirt or camouflage waders, but you should try to match the background. So a green, a tan, a brown is good in a situation like this. The worst thing you could do is to wear a bright red or orange or a white shirt, unless the trees behind you are bright red or bright orange or in the fall. Otherwise, nice muted earth tones are a good color to wear in small streams, both for your hat and for your shirt. What, I, what I'm seeing over on the other side is an area of water that's just a little bit slower and deeper against the bank. There are a couple rocks on the bottom for protection. The water's deep enough to hold a trout, and there's good current there. Try, I usually like to try the good spots first because every, every subsequent cast you make, you take the chance of spooking the fish. So I try to make my first cast count and put it in the best spot. And then I'll work over to some smaller spots that aren't quite as good, maybe a little shallower, but you never know. Fish aren't always where they're supposed to be. When you're fishing a small stream, you're not gonna get a very long float. Your fly's gonna drag or it's gonna get pulled under. So you wanna make short cast, and you wanna try not to put your fly line over the top of the fish. Fly line lands on top of the fish, it's gonna scare them. When you're fishing in small streams, the roll cast is gonna become your best friend. The roll cast has no back cast, so as long as you have some room in front and a little bit of room on top, you could just come back and flick the line out there. You don't have to cast very far, and you don't have to worry about the trees behind you. Now, people worry about uh, using a roll cast with a dry fly because you're not swishing it back and forth and, and uh, removing the moisture. But you're using high-floating flies most of the time in small streams, and if you dress them well, you could roll cast a dry fly repeatedly without false casting in between and still keep that fly floating for quite a while. You know, you seldom need to worry about matching the hatch in a small stream. We have some mayflies hatching today. We have some caddisflies hatching today, some stoneflies. But you know what I'm going to use? A big old fluffy stimulator, an attractor dry fly you don't really need to worry that much about matching the hatch because these fish see lots of different kinds of insects all day long and they seldom see enough of any one kind to get selected. By using a big fluffy dry fly, not only can I see the fly and can the fish see it, but if some really tiny trout come up to the fly, they won't be able to get it in their mouths and I can sort through the smaller fish in the stream. Usually a dry fly is all you need in a small stream. The water shell, fish can see the fly almost all the time. But sometimes the fish don't respond to a dry, and then you gotta go to a nymph. What you can do is something called a dry dropper, where you take a big high floating dry fly, 
tie a piece of tippet on the bend of the hook and attach a nymph to that so that you've got, you're fishing a dry fly and you've also got a strike indicator and then you're fishing a nymph down below. Let's try it. So we've moved up to the next little pocket. Now I've got a nymph on. So we're gonna try a dry dropper in here. The fish haven't responded as well as they usually do to a dry. So we're gonna try a nymph and hang it on the bottom and see what happens. So again, keep my rod high, work the tail of the pool, and then work up a little bit. But here we go. There's a little brown trout. Took the dry, even though we, even though we had a nymph on, he came up and took the dry. Beautiful little golden brown trout. He took the dry instead of the nymph, even though we went to a dry dropper. This guy. Didn't take the nymph, he took the dry. Now that was fun. You may not have any trout very close to home, but chances are, if you live in the northern part of the United States or in Canada, or even if you live in the south and you have elevations above 1,500 feet close by, you may very well have some secret trout streams not too far away. Do a little poking around and see what you find. Exploring is half the fun. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet.